what is this word anyway? Tete a tete? I'm not familiar with this phrase. Is it, is it, I assume it's French, you know, because of the... What do you call them? Those little marks on top of the letters? I assume it's French. How do you pronounce it? And also, what's the meaning? I have no idea. In fact, oh, I could go to old Google once again, learning new things. Tete tete. Tete tete. Tete tete. tete, -tete. A private conversation between two people? Hmm, I guess that's what it means. Also, an S shaped sofa. Hmm. Weird. Oh, well, it's not, it's probably not, it's not that weird. I've just never seen an S shaped sofa before. So it's just weird to me. Alright. Our silly tate to tate. A two way conversation. Just a, a fancy word for just saying a conversation. Huh? Did you say something? Mush. Mush? Mush, mush, there's no time to waste. <laughs> oh, why are we running? I don't understand. The revolution waits for no one, Lorona. Ah, I'm so sore. Suddenly taking off into the rain might have been a bit ill-advised. Are you hurt, Aid? You're limping a little. Oh, just a, just a pebble in my boot. Don't want to take it off right now since it's raining, so I'll wait until we get to Miss Faye's house. Oh, okay. Upon making it to the usual place, we spot a pair of rowdy twins splashing around. It seems they were putting their rain boots to good use to make most of the occasion. Noticing our approach, Kalia kicks one last geyser of rainwater at Triss before turning to us. You guys are late. You know how long we've been waiting here for? And where's the letter? Tris grudgingly wipes off his dripping raincoat as we're instantly barraged with a series of complaints. Well, Nalela's not joining us today. She's glued pretty tight to her pillow at the moment. For her loss, Miss Faye says she had a special new story lineup for us today. I hope it's nice and cheery one this time. Nope. She told us to bring a pack of tissues so you wouldn't soak her nice furniture with your balling again. Oh, is it too much to ask for a happy ending? <laughs> well, off to Miss Faye's place we go then. Yeah, enough dawdling. We've already wasted enough time. Let's go, go, go! Our destination locked in, Kalia skips ahead and urges us to start moving. Gotta go fast, huh? Gotta go fast! If one were to behold our group from a distance as we went, we'd probably see a bit of a strange sight. As Kalia turns into a blue blur. Hmm. Beep. While Lerona and I strode along the path like normal people, the Lurichrins had other plans in mind. Kicking up, uh, kick, bleh, kicking up streams of water everywhere they go, they hop to and fro like overactive bunnies. Yeah. No, don't splash me. Naturally, we end up getting caught in the crossfire. I wonder. If Noletta were here, he'd probably be stumping up water spouts alongside the twins, dwarfing anything they made. Always imitating people, always so curious. That was what not, uh, that, sh that she was not here together with us. It felt surreal and a bit hollow. Laughter, cries, shouts. I watch on from the side, the lighthouse on the far shore. Under the cold rain of a dreary overcast sky, they danced, lively and carefree. They dance in opposition to stagnancy, coloring over the monochrome world with their vibrant acts of life. But I was not there with them. My heart was in a different place, sitting in a dark room by a certain someone's side, watching as they slept. Wait for us, Noletta. Are you still worried about Noletta and Bressel? Oh, library? That looks similar to a celestial library, but I guess this is just a normal library. Triggered by the door's opening, a little bell chimes out to signal that guests have arrived. Miss Faye's abode was not a normal residence by any means, a fact any entering visitor was immediately made acutely aware of. 
The first thing one ever beheld upon stepping foot in her room, or rather her home, was the breathtaking sight of towering bookshelves sprawling out before them. It was no overstatement to, stay, uh, to say the Faro House owned and administrated Sokotrine's largest library. The large central room we were in easily dominated the majority of the building, containing everything from recently bound novels to dusty tomes that spoke of ancient history. It was a place that bled an otherworldly sense of mystique. And I guess we're doing this on a Saturday morning, going to listen to a story by Miss Faye? That's what they mentioned. Hello? Kalia's announcement of our arrival reverberates throughout the massive room. Nope. A sound like something hitting wood, followed by a racket of collapsing books. Rounding the corner, we discover Alouette swaying amidst a pile of fallen books with stars orbiting around her head. Oh, okay, she's here. Oh, wow, you surprise, Alouette. Are you okay, Alouette? Didn't you hear the bell? Alouette had her head in the bookcase. She didn't hear. Uh, Taking care of another step on any books, I pat Alouette on the head. Patapion, patapion, pain, pain, go away. Ah, uh, thank you, Aid. Aside from her job at the Morella Bakery, Alouette also had a job working here under Miss Faye. <laughs> okay, <laughs> she has two jobs. Dealing with such a hefty workload day to day, she's quite the workaholic, isn't she? They're all out of order now. Turning to the nearby shelf, Alouette begins the painstaking task of reorganizing the books in their proper order. Well, do you want us to help out? I will go faster if we chip in. But Alouette shakes her head. No, can't lend a hand. If not in right order, Belly will scold Alouette. Scold, scold. A voice speaks up from behind as Alouette... Uh, behind us, as Alouette rather humorously impersonates an angry Miss Faye. I do not sound like that. Okay, I assume this is Miss Faye? Bella, Bella Saria? Bella Saria? Also, don't make it seem like I bully all you bully you all the time, Alouette. Miss Bella Saria Faro. Faro? Faro. The influential heiress of an old aristocracy house of Faro. A crisply dressed woman with roseate eyes. She was she was childhood friends with Papa and the Loritz dad's Alton. And the Loritz dad Alton? Okay, Alton is a name. I thought Alton was. It meant something else, but actually, it's just his name. Loritz dad. Basically, friends with our dad and our friend's dad. I guess our friend's dad. She was also a mother's cousin, being one of the few that shared a close relationship with her. Okay, so she might know our mother as well. After we're done here, I'll stay behind. There were questions I wanted to ask her in light of what I had learned yesterday. Oh, isn't it true you bully Alouette all the time though? Bullying is such a crude way to put it. There's more than one way for someone to express their love, you know. Belly loves Alouette, right? Yes, yes I do. Smiling wryly, Miss Faye ruffles Alouette's head. <laughs> the books? Alouette is fixing the books. Well, you can leave that for later. We have guests to accommodate now. They likely find tea and treats agreeable after their voyage from the Wayne. Uh-huh. Asking for a friend, but who made these treats start coming? I did. What of it? I guess we're playing the lottery today. <laughs> rude. <laughs> How rude. They are ordinary pastries, I have you know. I think Miss Faye's cooking is tasty. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Miss Faye was an enigma when it came to the kitchen. While some of the best meals I've ever had were made by her hand, she also holds the title of serving some of the worst meals I've ever eaten in my life. Hmm. She's like a gotcha, but for food. Probably because she has a tendency of getting bored and turning the recipe into an experiment, adding insane things that make the food bubble, change colors, and or even explode. I guess that's just her nature as head of Sokotrine's Chemical Research and Development Department, or Royal Alchemist, as she seemed to prefer despite its dateness. Teas and treats. Alouette will bring tea and treats. 
After stacking the books up in neat piles, Alouette disappears deeper into the building. Shall we treat our, retreat to our usual haven then? With a wave of her hand, Miss Faye beckons us further in. A cozy alcove on the second floor, lined with cushions and dominated by a comfy carpet. It was Miss Faye's favorite spot, reserved for her personal use. Upon arriving, Miss Faye settles into her iconic reading chair at the head of the carpet before surveying over our group. Hmm, I just realized. Is but is Miss uh, is Miss uh, is Naleta not here? Naleta slept in, so she won't be joining us today. Is that so, Miss Faye? It's nothing. Was just thinking that you seem to be limping a bit. Aid. Nothing escapes those piercing girl's eyes of hers. It's possible she knows about Project Binary. I should take the opportunity to inquire later. Yeah, she might know something. In fact, she might be involved directly, actually. She was like a royal alchemist, right? I guess we did go pretty ham and capture the flag yesterday. No, oh, so it wasn't a pebble. Are you actually hurt after all? Well, let me take a look. Oh, <laughs> that tickles, Lorona. Perry, repose! Oh, suddenly it's Dark Souls. Wah! Don't tickle me! Are we tickling our own now? Me too! Tickle tickle attack. No! Miss Faye gives a little sigh at the scene playing out before her. Oh, well, anyways, before we settle down for story time, why don't you children give me a rundown on your week? Kalia quick, uh, quickly takes point. Chattering on about our construction project, games day, and other hijinks as Triss acts out key events in tune to her narrative. Occasionally, I interject, usually to contribute a different perspective from Kalia's mildly, read heavily, biased account. <laughs> but for the most part, I watch on from the side as the Lyrit tag teams uh, covers our bases. Eventually, Alouette reappears with a teapot and a tray of sweets. While the others dig into the provided treats eagerly, I can't seem to work up much of an appetite. Curling up on the carpet, I snuggle up against Alouette's lap. She had taken her seat alongside us at Miss Faye's insistence that she had she take a break. For that, I was grateful, as Alouette's caresses were a welcome reprieve from the day's melancholy. Not well, I can't say I anticipated it. But Mother Nature's had been kind enough to set the mood for the, today's tale. Once we conclude our weekly report, Miss Faye begins leafing through a weathered-looking book, causing the Loritz to shift giddily in anticipation. Much like how Alouette was unmatched in the art of headpats, Miss Faye had no equal when it came to narration. There was something about her intonations that evoked and immersed the universe within you. Mm, amazing. Like a shepherd herding dreams, she never failed to capture and captivate our imaginations. The story I've selected is a bit darker than what you're used to. Oh, another dark story? Is it like the one with the doll? I have some reservations on whether or not you're ready for it. If you'd like, I can always choose a sprightlier, uh, sprite? Sprite? sprightlier piece? Sprightlier? Hmm. Never seen that word before. Sprightlier. Is that supposed to be a challenge? Oh, you better not underestimate us what we can uh, underestimate what we can handle, Miss Faye. I'm asking us if we can well, if we want to bail after dangling bait in front of our eyes is in poor taste, Miss Faye. Oh, it can't possibly be as sad as last week's story, right? Get those tissues ready, Lorona. Well, the curiosity of youth is such a lovely thing. Very well. I'll be expecting a good discussion afterwards then. Our attention is fully at her command. Miss Fate clears her throat before beginning. Oh, oh boy! Uh, today I'll be recounting to you a story that speaks the origin of the rain. Yeah, I actually like these. I like this part, or of like having a story within a story. I like the I like the little short story about the, the doll. So I wonder what this what this one is. There once was a village in a faraway land. Its people lived harmoniously off the land, leading happy and fulfilling lives. 
Life was vibrant and full of color, and children played carefully or carefreely amidst the tripping birds. But one day, the clouds disappeared from the sky, and rain stopped falling upon the land. The rivers running through the fields dwindled and dried up, leaving nothing for the people to drink. Oh no! So even the crops began to wilt and shrivel away, causing the people to, to despair as food ran short. Eking out everything they could to make it to the next day, the villagers managed to endure. But no matter how long they held on, the rain did not come. No matter how much they entreated the heavens, the sky did not hear their prayers. It was when all hope seemed to be lost that the whispers of a heavenly savior began to spread through the village. Somewhere in the nearby forest, where the foliage had remained green and healthy, there was rumored to be a goddess with miraculous powers, a goddess blessed with the ability to produce streams of pure, unadulterated water. Families with no options left clung to this mysterious rumor, searching the forest desperately for the fabled goddess. Then one fateful day, a mother whose son was on the verge of death finally encountered the goddess of legend. However, she was no divine goddess with a heavenly aura. She was but a little chipmunk of a girl whose head barely peeked above the shrubbery. But please, save my child, the mother begged to the girl with all her heart. He won't respond to me. He hasn't anything to drink for days. Yeah, water is one of the basic needs of uh, necess necessities of uh, human beings. You know, you're you, you're st sooner to like uh, die from dehydration than you are to starve, right? But no matter how much she pled, the girl could not fathom the mother's words. Having lived in the forest for all her life, she did not know of language. However, when the girl saw the boy's wasted body, she was overcome with great sorrow. He was suffering and in great pain, and so, wishing that the boy wouldn't cry, or wouldn't die rather, oops, sometimes I read too fast, uh, wishing that the boy wouldn't die, the girl leaned over him and began to cry. Big beautiful tears began to drip from the girl's eyes in unbelievable amounts, trickling through the boy's parched lips. Letting him drink tears as clear and pure as the rain that once fell upon the land, the girl pulled the boy back from the boundary of life and death. Hmm. The smile of a young girl whose face was still wet with tears, that was the sight the boy opened his eyes to upon being saved from certain death. Meanwhile, having witnessed a miracle, the mother cried out in gratitude and implored the girl to come back to the village so that she may help others in need. She needs to help everyone by crying? I don't know. That's a lot of crying you need to do. Unable to comprehend anything though, the girl could only let herself be taken away from her tranquil garden. Her first exposure to the outside world deeply affected her. The village she was brought to, behold, had become but a wasteland of death and decay. Immense sorrow filled the girl's heart at the sight of so many people suffering. Spreading word of her miraculous life-giving tears, the mother took the girl into her home as if she were one of her own. Countless came to her doorstep in search of salvation from their unending hell. The girl wept for every one of them, forsaking none of her boundless compassion. By drinking up the pristine tears she shed, the people managed to recover from the brink of collapse. Yeah, but how long can she do this? Is this... Is this like, um... Sustainable? You know? Doesn't she need a drink as well? She's gonna dehydrate from crying so much. For several weeks, the villagers managed to stay off uh, their uh, deprivation. But though the tears she wept were enough to quench their thirst, their neglected hunger continued to grow by the hour. People whose lives she had poured her, out, her heart out to save began to perish from starvation before long. In their desperation to survive, the villagers were forced to break an unspeakable taboo. Oh no. That taboo was cannibalism. Nom nom nom. Those that were unable to defend themselves were the first to go. The young, the elderly, the infirm. The girl washed on as a baby was ripped from his mother's arms and devoured by villagers that had lost their minds to hunger. Neighbors had stuck with each other through thick and thin, began to turn on one, uh, turn on one another, 
painting the landscape sickening shades of scarlet. Gotta at least cook them then. <laughs> at least cook them. Don't eat them raw. <laughs> not that'll help anyway, because even if they resort to cannibalism, it's not like the population is sustainable as well. Just like her tears, eventually they're gonna run out of people to eat, <laughs> and they're just gonna die anyway. Oh well. Those scarlet visions tormented the girl, bringing her such anguish that blood flowed from her eyes as she wept before the village's withered field. Blood. Hmm. It was then that, from the crimson tears that touched the cracked soil, Flora began to spring up wondrously from the earth. Oh, okay. Upon witnessing this miracle, the girl tried to use the girl's power to nourish their fields. Oh, oh I know where this is going. But though the girl wept tourists through the day and night of the villagers' plight, it was never the tears of blood that they needed. It was in that hopeless situation that the villagers came to a terrible conclusion. If the girl would not cry tears of blood, they, ha they would have to take it from her. The only way to garner the blood they needed was by cutting into her body and draining it. A stone shrine atop a hill overlooking the village, the people locked the girl up there, driving her to a state of perpetual near death as they extracted her blood over and over again. Well, it's the only thing we can we can't uh, it's the only way we can survive was how they rationalize it. Whenever it seemed like the girl was becoming numb and crying less as a result, the villagers had no choice but devise crueler ways to hurt her. It was a wretched state of existence in which they could only subsist with the girl's blood and tears flowed freely. But even then, the girl never forsook the villagers. It was a smile that grew weaker by the day she continued to cry, thinking only of their sake. However, her smile did not ease the villagers' hearts. They feared it, were afraid of it, afraid of what that smile meant, of what they had become. And so but they began to chant it, a curse, or perhaps a prayer to absol absolve them of their sins. A witch. She's a witch. She's the reason rain stopped falling upon the land. An, an incorruptible smile that not even layers of blood and tears could blemish. It was the smile of a witch. And while there were none that could turn a deaf ear to the girl's sobs, which trickled without end from the top of the hill, no one spoke of it. Their throats quenched and their bellies full, the villagers chose to not see, to not hear. Hmm. A girl crying on top of a hill, people drinking from like a river of her blood and tears, hmm. people choosing not to see the truth. There's some parallels you can draw here. But the land had begun to flourish and gain its color and the nourishment of the girl's less blood and tears. At long last, the people had gained, regained a semblance of peaceful days they once knew. But there were those who could not accept it. Back in the house, the girl had called home since coming to the village, the young boy whose life had been saved in the forest asked of his mother, Mother, why won't you drink? No matter how many times the boy brought a cup of water to her mouth, the mother would not part her lips. The family had been haunted by the girl's tormented cries for many sleepless nights now. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. As she lay in bed, she would repeat those words to herself without end. I should have never brought you to the village. The mother had come to view the girl as her own child during the time they lived together. Unable to bear the thought of drinking her the daughter's tears as she was tortured day in and out, the mother had gone without drinking for days. Now on the verge of dying from thirst, the mother spoke to her son for the final time. Please, grant your mother one last selfish wish. That girl. Do you mean sis? Yes, your sweet beloved sister. The mother grasped her son's hand tightly as she spoke her final words. Please, be by her side. The boy, the boy waited until nightfall to carry out his mother's dying wish. Under a moonless, starless sky, he climbed to the hill to where the girl was being held. Breaking into the temple from which countless streams cascaded and flowed, the boy was met with a heart-wrenching sight. The girl's small figure had once been filled with the vigor of youth, but now she was barely recognizable. From hollow eyes that had endured the darkest of human despair, 
fountains of water were streaming unendingly, serving as the origin of the rivers running outside. Sis, sis. The boy struggled to release the girl from her restraints, but it was no use. Hands that the boy had held steady as he taught her how to write, they were now twisted from ruthless disfigurement. The wrists the boy had made little bracelets for her from the flora the girl called forth. They are now melded with the blood staining her iron shackling her. The girl stared vacantly at the boy as he continued his futile attempt to free her, unable to understand. She didn't want him to be sad, but he was not hurt or hungry in any way. He'd even grown healthier since the last time they met. So why? Why was he making such a pain face? Knowing that the villagers would be back soon, the boy fell to his knees and began to cry. He didn't want her to be trapped here any longer. He didn't want her to be hurt anymore. But there wasn't anything else he could do. That was when he felt a light touch on his chin. Clanking her chains as she reached out with what remains of her hands, the girl lifted the boy's head and began to weakly wipe away his tears. When his vision cleared, the boy saw that the girl had a beautiful smile on her face. A smile just like the, first di just like the time she first saved him. Even when the chains had stolen away her freedom, deprivation had wasted her figure, and her abuse had dulled the light in her eyes, her smile had not been lost. More than anything, the boy wanted to protect that smile. And so, with trembling movements, the boy reached out and slowly wrapped his fingers around the girl's neck. Unable to stop himself from crying at the thought of what he was doing, the boy tightened his grip. But the girl's smile never left her. Even as the strength slowly lift, left her body, she did not stop. Excuse me. Uh, wiping, wiping away his tears, her hand continued to move. It was only when that hand fell back limply to her side that the boy knew it was over. Water was no longer flowing from the girl's eyes which were loosely shut in a state of peace. Even now, it looked like she was smiling serenely as she slept. Easing her to the ground, the boy watched on as the artificial rivers lost their origin and began to run dry. Though he knew the villagers would return at any moment, the boy couldn't to bring himself to leave the girl's side. Before long, countless people swarmed to the temple, enraged that their life-giving water had stopped flowing. They could not forgive the culprit that had destroyed the village's foundation and condemned them all to certain death. You killed the witch! You killed the witch! Oh, she's not a witch! To the villagers' outrage, the boy roared back with anger of his own. The girl had wiped away everyone's tears, stopped at nothing to help others in need. But who had been there to wipe away her tears? The villagers seized and beat the boy, dragging him outside and tying him to a stake. Lighting a fire beneath his feet, they threw rocks and cursed the boy as he burned. You killed the witch! You killed us all! Even as his flesh blistered and blackened under the flames, the boy continued to cry out. She's not a witch! She's not a witch! In a broken voice, the boy repeated it over and over again. She's not a witch. But his cries fell upon unhearing ears, until at long last, he stopped moving. It was then that something impossible began to happen. Oh. You know, I was thinking, yeah, that, that might, be, might have been the end of the story, but... What else is gonna happen? Oh. Something began to fall from the sky. Ah, yes, the origin of rain. Wet and clear, like the sky itself was crying. It was rain. A certain soul had been bearing witness to the tragic scene. It was the girl who had ascended into the sky upon being released from her cage of flesh. She had watched on as the boy screamed in tear-choked agony. Cursed by everyone, forsaken by the world, he died in great pain, his voice having reached no one. She had watched, powerless to stop it, no matter how much she wished to. And so with eyes overflowing with more tears than ever before, from heaven she cried. Clouds came and covered the sky, raining torrential swallows of water that swept away all in its wake. 
The girl wept madly, unable to stop even as her tears swallowed and extinguished all life. She grieved alone in the sky for many years before her tears ran dry, flooding the land several times over. Well, how ironic. They wanted rain, so... Or rather, they wanted water, right? So we give it to them. Do as much as you want until you all drown. Now there she is. Many millennia passed before the waters finally receded. It was only after eons of solitude that the girl spotted life beginning to take root again. Overwhelmed by the moving sight, she began to sob once more, only to drown the fragile seas of life. In a heartbreaking turn of events, the land became flooded again as she lam uh, la uh, lam lam lamented her clumsiness. It was not until many more eons passed that the water receded and life struggled once more to take root. Placing all her hope in that fragile, blooming life, the girl vowed deep in her heart to nurture it with prudence, resolving to cry just enough that it wouldn't wither, but not so much that it drowned. The girl directed her tears to fall from the sky in delicate equilibria, equal equilibrium. Occasionally, she would commit an error, disrupting the frail balance and causing a drought or flood to devastate the blossoming flora. In panic and heartbreak, she would weep remorsefully, flooding the land once more. But every time the water cleared away, life always sprang back tenaciously, keeping her belief alive. Repeating that cycle over and over again without losing faith, the girl finally saw the day that people roamed the earth once more. For those people, she continues to weep to this very day, suffering without end so they can live on. What an interesting creation myth. To this moment, the girl lives on, eternally bound to the sky. Ah yes, the rain goddess is a waifu. When clouds come and cover the skies, some people feel immense sadness at her tears. Others feel soothed, relieved that they had not been forgotten and holding her timeless sacrifice dear to their hearts. Some innocent children pout, complaining that they cannot play. With a characteristic shift of her posture that indicated she was getting close to wrapping up, Miss Fay flips to the final page. Even after being wronged so harshly by them, she continues to watch over and love people. In times of scarcity, when people suffer from the absence of her blessing, she witnesses their pain and cries so they may eat and drink. In times of war, when people raise the land and commit atrocities, she beholds their sins and sobs so that the spilt blood might be washed away. And in times of prosperity, when people smile and laugh amidst flourishing fields, she admires their happiness and weeps in mirth so that they may continue to thrive. With a deep breath, Miss Fay concludes the somber story. Slowly shutting the book, she leans back to her chair to let the ending ferment in her minds. So, what do you think? Certainly not the tamest of stories, huh? Miss Faye smiles wickedly as she surveys our speechless faces. Wah! <laughs> it's so sad. Shedding tears that would give the rain goddess a run for her money, Lorona latches on to the closest person to her. <laughs> I assume she's blowing her nose or something. With a hapless expression, Chirs rubs her back as she bowls and blows snot all over him. Throw in a little exfusciation and you two could react, reenact the tempo scene for us, hmm. Knowing those two though, our tragic narrative would veer straight into slapstick territory. Well, after all she did for them, I can't believe what the villagers did to the girl. It was inhumane. Well, it was perfectly human. Most people would do the same if placed in that situation. Even if I were to die from hunger, I can't imagine doing what they did. Well, we can only say that because we don't know what it's like to be on the verge of starvation. It's not only about yourself as well. Each of those villagers had people they held dear, friends and family that were, that were slowly dying alongside them. If the only way to save your kin is through forsaking an outsider, there's no question what you'll choose. The scale will only tip one way if you weigh the life of a loved one against the life of a stranger. But the girl wasn't a stranger to the villagers. She saved every one of their lives and suffered beside them. I just can't accept it. 
how they turn on the very one who reached out to them. <coughs> it made me sneeze. Yeah. Hold on, I need to blow some snot of my own. <laughs> I really hate sneezing. I really hate stream, uh, sneezing on stream because, like, I gotta like stop what I'm doing, blow my nose, and blah, blah, blah. anyway. <clears throat> I just can't accept it. How they turn on the very one who reached out to them when they needed someone the most. She must have felt so betrayed, so alone. What I, what I can't understand is, why did they start calling her a witch? Well, probably so they don't feel bad? So they don't feel guilty? A reason that they have to be afraid of her? Well, when people brand someone a witch, it isn't really because they're afraid of the person in question. What they fear is something else. In the end, it's an instrument of dehumanization to protect and preserve their own humanity. Unless they're doing anything to their victim, free of blame. Because you're not a monster if the one you're torturing is a witch. Well, that's the part I hate the most. To brand her as a witch even though she devoted everything to them, it seriously pisses me off. Well, that must have been how the boy felt when the villagers kept calling her that. He kept rejecting it until the very end. A solemn silence descended upon us as we recalled the scene in question. It's true. The term witch is more often than not a sin of, a, of the sayer. Regardless of how the villagers dressed it though, what lays at the crux of this story is the concept of forsaken one to ensure the survival of many. Hmm. It's a classic uti utilitarianism. Utilitarianism? Utilitarianism. Well, I hate that kind of thinking. The idea that humanity needs to sacrifice people for the greater good. I like it how you feel, Kalia. But it can't be denied that much of the life we know has been built on the sacrifices of others. Even so, people's lives aren't numbers to be plugged into some formula. Yes, utilitarianism. It's hard to say that word. Util utilitarianism. Utilitarianism? Utilitarianism. It's the philosophy of cogs, not human beings. But it's not always the case that humanity takes lives for the greater good. There are times when people willingly offer it up. I don't think we have any right to deny them from doing so. No, it was a shaky belief. No, something more uncertain, like a hope. Mother's death on the day I was born. Papa's confession to killing her. The fact that I was here now, at this place, at this time. The fact that she was not. Was Mother's death a sacrifice? A sacrifice to bring me into the world? If so, I wanted to believe. I needed to believe. Yeah, okay, I was trying to think back. Uh, her mom... ...died on the day she was... She, ...that Adelise was born, and, and Dad saying he killed her... ...is it really just like, you know, just... Like a complication during birth, and that's what killed her. And dad was just against saying that I killed her, but like indirectly, you know, not not literally killed her, but like indirectly killed her, like by making her pregnant, you know, and stuff. But how would he know that it would kill her? I don't know. Maybe he did know. I don't know. Hmm. If so, I wanted to believe. I needed to believe. That she had chose, uh, she has chosen this path of her own, own free will. That she had wished for it. Humanity will always need a sacrifice, even when it doesn't wish for one. Recall how there used to be rain at the very beginning of the story. 
If I was to imagine, there was previously another sacrifice that made rain fall from the sky. A role that is replaced over time, like a cycle that nobody wishes for, but everyone still needs. Miss Faye adjusts her glasses and gives a small sigh. Listen well, children. All human beings hurt something simply by being alive. Just by continuing to exist, the choice to forsake something to gain something has been made. There is nothing wrong with that. It is not a sin to be alive. There was no mistake. She was looking straight at me. Miss Fay. To tell the truth, it didn't matter what the villagers did. Even if the boy never killed the girl, and the villagers continued extracting her blood, the villagers' fate uh, doesn't change. No one can survive having their blood drained like that for long. Eventually, the girl would have perished, with the village expiring alongside her. Yeah, that's what that's what I was saying. Well, no matter what anybody does, it'll end in the same way. Something like that is just too hopeless. Well, I mean... I guess, yeah, because I was thinking they could have done something. Maybe find a way to replicate the the water that the girl gave, you know, in, in a way that would sustain them long term, but I, I don't know. I don't know how you would do that, however. But that's not that's not the point of the story. The point the point of the story is not to find a solution for that problem. It's the fact that, you know, that humanity needs to sacrifice something in such a way as as a tragedy that they do and stuff. No matter how much they struggled, no happy ending awaited the characters in this story. Such was a, was a script they were bound by. Rain is saddling yet soothing. Life is a child that cannot survive without drinking up the tears of the mother that gave birth to it. And yet, in the end, the people were drowned by the very life-giving water that nourished them. How poetic. Yes, it's called a dramatic irony. Unfolding her legs, Miss Faye rises from her seat. Anyways, that's about all the time I have had for you children. Turning to me, Miss Fay pulls a sealed letter out of her pocket. This is for your father, Aid. Be sure he gets it. And make sure you don't peek. Well, I'll tell him he has a new stack of paperwork to finish by tonight. Now let's just say the two of us have a long discussion to be had. Though I was curious about the letter's contents, I had no intention of betraying Miss Fay's trust. Well, thanks for telling such a unique story today, Miss Faye. Definitely made you made uh, made me you made me you made made me you made me you think. No, it made me think. I think it was pretty messed up, but today's stories was one of my favorites. I'm glad we ended up reading it. You better not pull any punches when it comes to the intense stuff like this, Miss Faye. The girl's devotion to people was so admirable, even though it was so sad. I really liked it, but. Maybe it wouldn't hurt to have a cheerier story next week? People fall in love with sad stories as well as happy stories. Compassionate yet cruel. We wish we wish for happiness while seeking sadness. Just like the story of the doll, again. Human beings are such a messy bundle of contradictions. But in the end, isn't that the way it should be? Oh, Miss Faye. Trust is curious what the title of the story is and who wrote it. Hmm. Unknown, although I can't conceive why, everything but text itself has been omitted. A book without a title, where even the author remains unnamed. Now don't tell me this is some cliché development where you reveal yourself to be the author, Miss Faye. Ah, I can see it. Miss Faye is definitely the kind of person that would write a pitiless story like this. Such aspirations against my character. Aspersions or asp not aspirations, aspersions, aspersions. How rude! <laughs> Miss Faye's sulky face is the best. Don't you think you should dial back on how much you tease people, Aid? As a wise old woman once said, "There's more than one way for someone to express their love," you know. Uh oh! Looks like she's seriously about to pop a vein. Time for a tactical retreat. Oh dear heavens! Look at the time. We better be off now. Good day, Miss Faye. Oh, you're not gonna stay? I thought we were gonna have like a little chat with uh, Miss Faye about what we know now, right? But I guess not. Maybe we can infer from what she uh, said a little about the story. 
about the sin of living, you know? Or rather, that it's not a sin to be living as a human, and stuff like that. Well, take care, you little rascals. Hmm. That was weird. As I don my rain gear and make to leave the others, though, a sudden pain spikes through my right eye. Overcome with vertigo, I lose my balance and bump into someone. Oh, Alouette. You've been so quiet, I forgot you were here. Alouette just woke out, yeah? Oh, yeah, so you were sleeping. For some reason, her complexion seemed much paler than usual. Alouette, there's something wrong. What's the matter? If you don't tell me of your words, I won't understand. Alouette had a bad dream. Tell me, Alouette. Drawing close, Miss Fay places her hands on Alouette's shoulders. What happened to your dream? What was it about? No, no. Alouette doesn't know. Alouette doesn't remember. Hmm. I see. Go ahead and see the children off. If the rain doesn't get better, you're welcome to stay the night. Eh? I sleep over with Belle. Sounds fun. But everyone is waiting for me back home. Without responding, Miss Faye disappears deeper into the building. What are you two dilly-dallying if we're around here for? We're all ready to go. I'm coming. The pain in my eye was still throbbing, making it difficult to gather my thoughts as I followed behind the others. Hmm, why, why did Alouette have a bad dream that she can't remember? Hmm, does it have anything with her eye throbbing? Maybe, or maybe not, I don't know. The rain had greatly, greatly intensified during our stay. It's uh, persuasive, pervasive, pervasive. Roaring was as if the earth itself were rebelling against the sky. Wow, it's gotten really bad. As much as I hate to, should we call it a day and go home? Well, you three go ahead. I need to talk with Miss Faye about something, so I'll be staying behind. Oh, okay, so we are gonna have a little chat. Alright, I guess we'll see you tomorrow then. Make sure you rest up, okay, Aid? Yeah. Upon separating with them, I gaze up at the dreary, overcast sky. Hmm? prismatic colors. It was there, welling up th from deep inside me, a vision of a burning sky. What's this feeling? This feeling that everything is coming apart at the seams. Everything's falling apart. Hmm, Triss? What? Yeah, pick up the pace, Triss. We're gonna look like drowned cats by the time we get home. The onslaught of raindrops pounded down, pounded down on us like tiny hammers, rendering Kalia's shout barely audible. We were running home after separating with everyone else. Um, are we Triss? Actually, that tr little transition. Because I was thinking, yeah, Ad Adelise was uh staying at the library, and we we're going home, so I assume we're Triss. Something causes me to stop in my tracks, though. Tris, we're not getting dry by the moment here. Or by the moment here. Kalia complains to me as she skids to a halt. But she falls silent when I raise my hand and point to my ear. Though faint, something that clashed disharmoniously, disharmoniously? Against the roaring rain could be heard. Concentrating on my hearing, I wander off to the path into a nearby bush. Is that a burn? Something sounds wrong with it. Something about the cry's tone was hurting my heart. Over there, Tris. It lay in a hole lined with frayed netting. Bird with blazing orange feathers. Hmm. I think they mentioned like a creature like that, where uh, Mr. Nero got like a hair clip, I think? The orange feathers? Yeah. A phoenix oriole? A species that was supposed to have gone extinct since the fire of collapse. Before us, what was, was surely among the last of its kind was struggling with all it had to stay alive. The bird cries out pitifully, 
flapping its wings in a desperate attempt to stay afloat amidst the rising water. Oh, we need to save it. I sprang into action, dripping my hands into the water to try and pull the bird free. But my blind fumbling is to no avail. The bird's panicked flailing and incessant downpour was making it impossible to see. Oh, it's drowning! We look on in frozen horror as the bird's head disappears under the surface. Scoop out the water, Triss! Cupping my hands, I shovel the water out in a frenzy attempt to drain the hole. But while I'm able to displace enough water for the bird to pop up and breathe, the pouring rain makes it so that I can't relent for an instant. If I stop, the rising water will drown the bird in no time. But there's no way for me to free this bird in this state. I can't keep this up forever. Oh, damn it! Unable to stand by any longer, Kalia throws herself to her knees and plunges her head into the cold water. Oh. She must have come to the same conclusion as me. If we can't see what's trapping the bird from above, our only option is to try looking from below the water's surface. <coughs> Pulling her head above the surface, Kalia spews water out of her mouth as she struggles to catch her breath in the thick rain. It's all tangled up in the netting. But though we now knew what the problem was, we were no closer to a solution. We simply didn't have enough to work with. My hands were full of scooping out the water, while Kalia had nothing to reach out with. The only thing she could do was look on powerlessly from the side. Her face twists into an expression I haven't seen in a long time. Bitterness. Frustration. It's always been like this. Even though it's right before me, I've never been able to. I could almost hear it, the thoughts running through her head. No! Unable to accept it, Kalia plunges her head below the surface and bites onto the netting, ensnaring the bird. Wow! Widely, madly, she gnashes her teeth in a desperate attempt to cut through. But though she sticks at it stubbornly for as long as she can, before long she runs out of breath. <coughs> Coughing up the blood that floods into her lungs, Kalia takes a deep breath and dives back under. No matter how many times she tries to chew through the netting, it doesn't give. The only thing she was accomplishing was tying herself out. No. Hmm, I wonder why they're so desperate in saving this bird. Well, other than, you know, just general compassion for the fact that uh, this is the very last bird in its line, so maybe just that. As we repeated our futile cycle, the bird could only continue to weaken. Its movements were slowing, its cries growing faint. A realization dawns upon me as my fingers begin to numb or grow numb from the biting chill. At this rate, it's going to die. No, no, no! Kalia croaks weakly as she dips back under after another unsuccessful attempt. But she's only able to hold her breath for a few seconds before having to rise again. My only exhausting act was taking its toll on me as well. I couldn't feel my arms anymore. But even then, we don't stop. <sighs> we can't stop. The sound of falling rain. It was the only thing that could be heard. The bird's cries were no more. Slumping to the ground, Kalia stares on vacantly as water overflows the hole. Aww. But even though the bird has ceased moving long ago, they don't stop. With hands that had long lost all feeling, I continue to paw weakly at the water. It's the same. It's the same as that time. That time? Mm, okay, this might be another reason why they're trying to save the bird. It reminds them of... Something else that happened in their past, probably during the fire of collapse, maybe. In my mind's eye, I can't help but see it. The circle of light above us, so far out of reach. The slippery stone surrounding us, so dark, so cold. The warm blood flowing from, through my fingers, so red. So red. Stop. Let go of her. Stop it, Triss. Let go of her, Triss. It's dead. She's dead. Ah. I grab at my temples as a nauseating pressure begins to build up in my skull. Deep within me, something begins to smolder. A fire was trying to catch. 
but deprived of air, if I was nothing more than smoking embers. Why? The well's chilly water, slowly running red as the life bleeds out of her body. Something hot begins to leak from the corners of my eyes as images from that time consume my vision. Why? My bloody hands, slowly becoming numb with pain as I slam them against the stone walls. The sensations of that day began to meld and overlap with the present, sending tremors rippling through my body. I'm sorry. Her chapped lips, repeating one thing. Sorry. Repeating one thing. The ashes of a failed fire swell up inside me as the verse presses down on my heart like a suffocating vice. I open my mouth in a frail attempt to release the rage and grief searing me. But unable to produce the words that could carry it all away, I choke and gag pathetically. I have, I have no way to speak, but I must scream. It was like there was a cork in my throat. With no way to escape, the cloud of swirling cinders closed madly at my insides. Going to burn away from the inside out. Words that wouldn't come. A flame that cannot be extinguished or quelled. No matter how much I wanted to howl and roar with all my heart, I couldn't utter a single thing. So I start to run. I take off with all my might into the curtain of falling rain. Tress! Halia screams out from somewhere behind me, but her cries don't reach me. With no regard to where I'm heading, I dash forward madly. I just don't understand. Why? Why can't I do anything? Yet again, I was powerless. Unable to even cry out in protest as it all slipped through my fingers. Tress! I'm chasing after something, but I can't see what. For some reason, I could barely make out what was ahead of me. Something was clouding up my vision so much that I could only vaguely discern its receding outline. Tress! Ugh. It's getting away. It's getting away. It's getting away. Tress. Even though I had long disappeared from my view, I don't relent in my pursuit. I didn't know any other way to deal with all the things smoldering inside me. So even though I could barely see in front of me, I continued to run. Forward. Forward. Endlessly. Eternally. Tress. My lungs are tearing to pieces. My heart is pounding into paste. My legs are crumbling beneath me. With no outlet, the hot pressure continues to build up inside me. Like a bottle of scalding liquid that had been violently shaken up. Triss! I'm sorry, Triss. I'm sorry you had such a monster for a mother. Hmm. What? Okay, I'm a little confused here. It's kind of a curveball. Such a monster for a mother? I mean, it seems like... I thought, anyway, they... were somehow involved in the fire of collapse, but I don't know how that timeline works. Were they... To like when do when did that happen? I can't remember. Like were they involved in the fire collapse or was this a different incident overall? Entirely. Like apparently they were stuck in a in the well or something and someone was bleeding, someone died. The monster for mother? Was it their mother that caused that incident? Or was it something else? Or is that does this sentence mean something else? You know? Hmm. I stumble, trip, and collapse to the ground. But it still wasn't enough. The things inside me were still burning, burning, burning. This feeling of being stifled and smothered, I couldn't stand it. Unable to find any release, I curl my hands into claws and begin gouging out chunks of the muddy earth below. But unsated by its lack of resistance, I begin to rip up my skin and hair feverishly. I wanted to scream out with all my soul, cursing this world for tearing away what I held dear. But I had no voice to protest the world's cruelty. My mouth merely flapped open and shut pathetically like a dying fish. A very loud silence. Someone wraps their body around me, 
enveloping me in a maddeningly warmth. In a in a maddeningly maddeningly in a maddeningly warmth. Hmm. Tris, please. Kalia pleads to me as she hugs me ineffectually with her stunted arms. I thrash wildly, violently knocking her into the mud. But undeterred, she gets back up and throws herself on me again. Tris, stop! You're hurting yourself. Unable to stand the sense of restraint, I shake her off once more. But even though she can't hold on to me very well, she doesn't stop trying. No matter how many times I send her tumbling into the mud, she stubbornly flings herself back onto me. Well, this is kind of like a parallel you can draw here with uh, with the uh, Rue siblings and the Lyra twins. A very similar thing is happening here. After a final attempt to subdue me, I collapse face first into the mud, panting heavily as Kalia embraced me brokenly from behind. Our heavy breathing, the rain's apathetic pattering, were the only sounds that registered in my dim consciousness. I wanted to close my eyes to the world, to deny everything that made it up. I wanted to disappear, to wake up to a place where everyone welcomed me with warm smiles. I desired nothing more than to hear her gentle voice telling me it was all but a horrible nightmare. For a moment, I felt like what I wished for, for uh, what I wished for, would actually come true. But then Kalia spoke, tearing me away from that hopeless dream. You remembered, didn't you? Oh, mommy died. Yep, I mean that. Yes, yeah, pretty much confirms it. I I think this incident is how it's uh. How it's related, what triggered their memories, what triggered their trauma. Apparently, their mother died at the bottom of a well, and they were there too. Not sure the about like the about the, I guess, the situation surrounding that, but something like that happened. Her words cut into me like a sharp blade, forcing me to stay rooted in reality's cold domain with her. You still carry it with you even now. It lay on the ground before us, a piece of fabric stained with blood. The blood was an illusion, one I've never been able to escape. Mother's handkerchief. After all these years, I had long lost its vivid blue tint, leaving nothing but shades of phantom red. It was a reminder of that day. The day Mother and I fell into a well. Oh, okay, okay, that explains it, okay. Mother and Triss, or mom, his his mom, or their mom, and Triss fell into a well. Did uh, did Kalia was Kalia there too? Was she in the well, or was she above? You know, talking to him, maybe. The day Mother tried to kill me. Oh. Oh. Okay, I think I have an idea what happened. It's pretty tragic when you think about it. Well, obviously it's tragic. The weird twisted way. The day she died. I shut my eyes tightly, but the tears continued to squeeze out from beneath my eyelids. Overhead, the rain had begun to intensify. Crying under the rain was meaningless for one without a voice. What a horrible day for rain. Because even if they were to cry for eternity, under the rain, no one will ever notice. We were just getting trauma after trauma. What? Oh, 185? 15 years before the fire of collapse? Oh, we're going back in time. Interesting. Cool. I actually want to learn a little more about the world before like the present, right? So this is going to be interesting, maybe. I wonder whose pers perspective uh, we're going to be uh, exploring the past with. Hmm.